I spent a lot of time in the years following Fifty Shades of Grey hoping for something new. I feel like the weird sex niche is so underrepresented by media these days, especially mainstream media, and I often think to myself that there is nothing I would enjoy more than to watch another power fantasy written specifically so that our male lead can look cool and hump women. Obviously I'm joking, but still, we got the idol. Initially, The Idol seemed promising. It was a TV show intending to explore sexuality against a backdrop of exploitation, i.e. how do you own your agency, sexuality and bodily autonomy in a world like Hollywood, where those same things are used and exploited. If your greatest inspiration comes from your sexual relationships with others, how do you maintain ownership of yourself when your boundaries are chipped away by expectations and a strong-armed sense of obligation? The initial vision for The Idol, as written by director Amy Seamitz, promised an exploration of those themes right from the beginning. She wanted to explore sex and sexuality through a female lens, but it wasn't to be. After a stunted time on set, Amy abruptly left production. The vacuum of her absence was quickly filled by her male counterparts, and what was released was significantly different than what was pitched. According to crew members who spoke anonymously with Rolling Stone magazine, it was like any rape fantasy that any toxic man would have in the show. And then the woman comes back for more because it makes her work better. While I am about to shit on this show for probably more than an hour, I will argue that calling the idol a rape fantasy is a bit extreme. Off the top of my head, every interaction in the idol is consensual. It is a power fantasy though, and a toxic power fantasy at that. It's, it's like a walking lynx advert. A completely vacuous, sleazy guy attracts a complete 10 out of 10 woman and has her hanging off him, desperate to fuck him all day and night, and she finds him so irresistibly sexy that he inspires her to create her best music. And it's sad. It's so very sad. Especially when she could be getting her inspiration from cool shirts. Hey folks, I'm back with more cool shirts mentions. You might have noticed that I wear a ton of cool shirts in every single video. They noticed too, and they sent me a ton of free stuff to try on for you in all of my videos. I'm super excited. I absolutely love the stuff they make. They're beautifully packaged, they're amazing quality, the designs are unique, and the only time I ever thought that I'd been recognized in person was when somebody came up to me and it turns out they just wanted to ask me where I got my Unlucky Charms t-shirt, which was a, was a dub for cool shirts, but it was a major knock for me. I was very sad. Check out my link in the description and use the code COOLMERTS, that's C-O-O-L-M-E-R-T-S, COOLMERTS, for 10% off your order. I'll be wearing a few pieces throughout the video so that you can check them out for yourself. Thank you again very much, cool shits. There were two major factors in the story of the idol that drew my attention. The story of the idol, i.e. the narrative itself, the A to B of the characters, the disaster that scored 19% on Rotten Tomatoes, and the story of the idol, the rat race of its production, the sabotage and the sleaze and the shafting of one director in a move that changed the course of this TV show forever. In fact, and I don't think I've ever had to do this before in the entire history of my channel, so I want you to understand how important it is, we're going to need to outline our major play Players and a general timeline of production before we go any further. I imagine many of you are aware of Abel Tesfaye, aka The Weeknd, an astoundingly famous Canadian singer who has recently been dipping his toes into acting with varying success. Back in June 2021, he announced that he would be creating, executive producing, and co-writing a TV show called The Idol. Oh, and he would also be starring in it alongside his later announced female co-star, Lily Rose Depp, who would be playing young star Jocelyn at a difficult crossroads in her life. Yes, Johnny Depp's daughter. Yes, she does look like him. Yes, that does muddy some of these sex scenes when we get a close-up of Johnny Depp's cheekbones set in the face of an earnest 23-year-old actress, and no, it's not her fault, but it does happen. Tesfaye's work was to be assisted by one Sam Levinson of Euphoria fame, a director notable for his gritty and hypersexualized choices in filmmaking, and one Amy Seamitz who initially began the project as a director. Unfortunately for Amy, the deck seemed to have been stacked against her from the beginning. According to an article by Rolling Stone magazine, three crew members alleged that Amy had been set up to fail from the start. She arrived on set seven weeks before the show was due to begin filming, only to be given half-finished scripts, a first-time show runner, a tight schedule, and near impossible expectations from HBO. One source commented that, as promising as those initial scripts were, the scripts for the final episodes were still only half finished and the finale completely unwritten. CMETS was consequently polishing up scripts and writing while directing. 
The same sources insisted that Amy did her best in an impossible situation, that she was gonna lose no matter what she did. Amy declined to comment on the situation as a whole, which can be construed either way, and I think any and all assumptions of hearsay were binned when Amy left production in April 2022, despite 80% of the project having already been filmed, at a cost of anywhere between 54 and 76 million dollars. Allegedly, none of her work whatsoever was used in the final product. This seems to have been directly linked to to Sfai's concerns that Seamus's work leaned too hard into the female perspective, and that the cult aspect of the show needed to be toned down. As we'll learn from watching the series, the knock-on effect of pulling back from understanding our main female lead and from sanding down the sharp edges of our cult rendered every character a touch shallower as a result. Withdrawing from the female perspective was bound to remove depth from Jocelyn's character and toning down the cult aspect of the show, the exploitation Amy sought to examine on screen, neutered Tess Faye's character in all the worst ways. We were left with a female character that was almost impossible to relate to, and a male semi-antagonist that lacked any kind of bite. After Amy left, Sam Levinson took over entirely as the director, and he was given a blank check with which to do so. In the wake of Amy's tight deadlines and limited resources and impossible expectations, Levinson was given all the time and money he needed to produce this show, and he used that time and money to entirely rewrite, recast, and reshoot The Idol. One anonymous source commented that they went into the idol hoping for an interesting collaboration, but it was extremely frustrating to see Amy doing her best to turn around some kind of project she could be somewhat proud of to HBO, and then for HBO to turn around and give Sam Levinson a blank check to turn it into Euphoria Season 3 with pop stars. And while all these sources are anonymous, if what they're saying is true, it's certainly not hard to believe given the final product. Still, that's not the whole picture. This isn't going to be some trashy hit piece on Sam Levinson. I've never met the guy, obviously, and I don't know what he's like to work with. Lily Rose Depp, our female lead, said he was an incredibly respectful and kind director, and various Euphoria stars have commented that he was completely okay to adjust scenes depending on what they were comfortable with, and I have no knowledge of Levinson beyond them. I also don't know how personal Amy's ejection from the project was, nor whether Levinson had any kind of say in it. But it was rough, both in terms terms of being a shitty thing to do to anybody, professionally or not, but in terms of how badly this seems to have derailed the production of the idol. It was actually at this point in the timeline that I became aware of the project, and I began to follow it with extreme interest. The irony of it was just far too potent. A woman attempting to create a story about enduring the exploitation of Hollywood without losing herself had been scrapped from the project for leaning too hard into the female perspective, and had been replaced by a director known specifically for his on screen sexuality. In the meantime, Tess Faye injected it with all the ingredients of a toxic man's fantasy, as described by The Hollywood Reporter, who commented that instead of skewering the misogynistic and predatory nature of the business, the idol became regressive rather than transgressive. That shit writes itself, and I gobbled up every scrap of news on the project until its release. Still, I couldn't cover the series when it came out. I assume that when the critic scores started staggering in, and Tess Faye realised that he'd made a massive expensive bag of dog shit, he pivoted hard, like that one comic strip where the guy pisses his pants and insists that he's living rent-free in everyone's mind because they're looking at him, Tess Faye responded to any and all criticism with a sneer, like he intended to spend millions and millions of dollars making a bad show just to own Twitter. He harvested the drama, and I didn't want to contribute to that. So I waited, and now it's November, and I'm ready to talk about it. So we know what The Idol was supposed to be, but what did it become? The Idol focuses on a troubled starlet named Jocelyn, played by Lily Rose Depp, who fell out of the spotlight in the year previous following an extreme mental breakdown after the death of her mother. As the series begins, we are thrown right into the fray of her revival and the build-up to her first return release, World Class Sinner. Still, Jocelyn falls back into the routine only to face the same problems that hounded her before she took her break. She is under immense pressure from from a record label who helicopter parent her, waiting for her to fail. She is surrounded by the push and pull of people who want to exploit her for money, and most important of all, she hates her new sound. World Class Sinner is a hit, but it's not her hit. She's not proud of it. She feels dead inside at the thought of releasing it. Her heart isn't in this. Until she meets Tedros Tedros, anyway, as played by Tess Faye himself. Local sweaty club owner Tedros quickly woos Jocelyn, and they embark on a sexual journey so 
intense and bristling with chemistry that she writes three more hits in the span of two weeks, all fueled by the fingers of this one random fellow. They have a lot of sex. It's hard not to see the idol as an extremely manufactured opportunity for Tess Faye to don a sleazy playboy persona and frantically dry hump Lily Rose Depp. This thing cost a lot of money to make, but it's an utter shambles, and he dry humps Lily Rose Depp a lot. Even on an entertainment basis, the idol really struggles. No single storyline is consistent. Many of them are shit. Some of them are weird. Very few are wrapped up. Episodes two to four are actually pretty boring as well. Characters to and fro, depending on whatever the writers seem to happen to have been smoking at the time, and motivations are so absent that it's laughable. Acting is touch and go, but no acting is worse than that of Tess Faye himself. Lily Rose acts circles around him. She has an incredible breadth of skill, she can cry on command, she is a complete natural on camera, and Tess Faye can barely emote. He is stiff, uncomfortable, and monotone. You can see the cues crop up on his face, like someone off screen is whispering all the emotions he needs to convey in the order they need to be conveyed. Robert Daniels of The Playlist observed, Tess Faye either hides under the cover of dim lighting, obtrusive coverage, or re-recorded dialogue dubbed into several scenes. And he's not wrong, which only makes this vanity project of a show even funnier. Jocelyn is introduced to us from moment one of The Idol. She is our main character, although that spotlight does expand a little bit as the show unravels. Jocelyn is going to be my favourite part of this discussion today, mainly due to her contradictory writing. Writing that won't be fully realised until we cover the finale, so sit tight for that. She demonstrates inhuman levels of fuckery across the series, and in the worst way possible, I had to watch the series twice to fully appreciate it. We are introduced to Jocelyn in a photography scene. She's prompted to display an array of emotions. Innocent, laughing, sexy, sad, and she can actually just drop a tear on cue. It's very impressive. The fact that she's framed by a big painting full of male faces only serves to remind me of that porn screenshot, and I have no idea whether or not it was intended. Now, you could argue that Jocelyn's fuckery is foreshadowed in moments like this, where she demonstrates a mastery of her own emotions, but this is something we'll discuss later. Now, this scene is especially bountiful with talking points. Not only do we have this sort of foreshadowing that Jocelyn is an evil genius, but we also get a glimpse into the cynical way this show is about to approach a myriad of topics. So, two conversations happen in this scene. We have a conversation about mental health, and we have a conversation about consent. The first conversation, the mental health conversation, occurs between Nikki, the cynical record label executive, and Xander, Joss's creative director and child friend. Xander has made some observations about this photo shoot. While at first glance, at least to me, it might look like your standard glamour shot featuring a gorgeous blonde with smoky eye and a silky red robe, a closer glance will reveal her wearing hospital wristbands, employing a recent or even current stay in a mental health ward. Xander furtively asks Nikki whether this is sexualizing mental illness, specifically since, as we learn, Joss has just taken an extended break from her work due to an enormous mental breakdown the previous year following the loss of her mother. Yes, Nikki responds, going into a pretty formidable monologue about how she's selling the idea that a mentally ill person might fuck you, whereas a mentally well person isn't going to shag anyone that isn't already firmly in their league. Now, there's a lot to that. The nuances of the shite Nikki just spat aside, she is clearly framed here as being a bad person. We aren't supposed to root for her. Sure, you could argue that maybe they attempted to characterise her as harsh but fair, and that what she's saying might have an element of truth to it, but I don't believe we're supposed to see her views as just here. Nikki is brisk, flippant, and keen to market Joss's mental illness when later in the series, she almost rips Jocelyn's career away from her for the same mental illness as the symptoms begin to flare up and affect Jocelyn's work. I believe the scene is supposed to show us that showbiz is harsh, cruel, and exploitative, and that while Nikki might have some innovative ideas about what she sells, she is ultimately not to be trusted. She is corporate capitalism incarnate, and that is completely fine. 
What muddies this message, however, is the other conversation happening within the same scene. See, Joss is a really gorgeous woman, she's very proud of her body, and she decides to slip some of that body out in the photo shoot, which the photographer begins to hungrily snap pictures of. At this point, an unnamed character rushes over to stop the situation. I don't know this guy's name, nor his official job title, but he's clearly some kind of legal handler. We'll call him Man Bun. Man Bun is characterised pathetically. He is weedy, awkward, and he wrings his hands like fucking Randall Weems. He asks why Joss has a tibby out, and the photographer tiredly shrugs and goes, I don't know, she did it. At this point, Man Bun explains to Joss, it is totally cool if you want to do nudity, you absolutely can do that, but we need to rewrite your contract to allow nudity. Currently, your contract doesn't allow nudity. And Joss sneers at him and makes a comment about it being her body, and he's like, yes, yes, it is absolutely your body, and if you want to do nudity, we can do nudity, we just need to rewrite the contract. The contract is here to keep you safe. He is the only person in the room earnestly rooting for Joss's contract to be honoured and her professional boundaries to be asserted, but he is laughed at by the cast. Joss again makes this argument that it is her body, an argument that frustrates me because Man Bun clearly agrees and respects this, and he awkwardly goes, this is the price of safety, putting a negative spin on the measures set in place to keep people from being exploited. At this point, Joss's manager and father figure, Haim, locks him in a bathroom, mocking him through the door, and Joss is free to get whatever she wants out for the remainder of the shoot. These two conversations happen more or less in tandem, and in the first 10 minutes of the show we are introduced to the ridiculous contradictions we are going to be faced with throughout. On one hand we see the sneering, cynical face of corporate America talk about how Joss will be used for her mental illness in the same way that she will be used for her body, and we are told that this is bad. And we see Joss crying later in this episode during dance practice, implying to us the incredible amount of pressure she might be feeling. On the other hand, we see the legal precautions in place to prevent Joss's exploitation mocked by Joss herself and used as an avenue for humour when they are literally locked away. It's like the writers hate both in different ways without understanding their implicit connection. God, those suits are so smug and conniving. All they do is exploit people and toss them aside, says the idol, who then goes on to say, and I'm so tired of having so many restrictions when I just want to take a picture of a pair of tits. The show simultaneously points fingers at predatory record labels, whilst also dismissing the infrastructure required to prevent predatory record labels from exploiting their stars. And this really is the first instance where we begin to see the conflict between what we know to be Amy Seemitz's original vision and this quite smug rewrite. See, apparently none of Seemitz's work made it into the final version, but there is this clear through line of anti-exploitation in the idol that is garnished by a layer of enthusiastic exploitation, either literally in the show or through the shots or the scenes used or the costumes in the final product. Which leads me to my next point, wherein I don't know how Lily Rose Depp typically dresses, this might be her personal style, and if so I hold up my hands, but this show is extremely voyeuristic, it is visually exploitative. We'll cover it as we go, but we see a lot of that in the way Lily Rose is dressed for every scene, and the way the camera eagerly soaks it up. This is most obvious when she is clearly dressed in outfits that are ill-fitting for what she's doing. When Joss heads out into the garden to practice her music video routine with a group of dancers, she is wearing the equivalent of a strip of fabric strapped hastily to her body, and things are trying to fall out. Throughout the entire dance routine you can see Lily Rose constantly readjusting this outfit to keep her breasts from falling out, when a nice vest or t-shirt would have far better accommodated a dance routine. Instead, Lily spends a good 50% of this show with her tits out, and another 50% of this show with them barely concealed. These selections were clearly made to titillate, as we see through the choices used when filming her in scenes, and the fact that no one in this show seems to be allowed to wear a bra, Jocelyn's visual style is very much there for the male gaze. These scenes also introduce a few other components of the story. Joss's friend and personal assistant Leia is here, which is a conflict that will be explored as the story continues, and a photo of Joss is leaked onto the internet with a face covered in cum. A lot of noise is made about this photograph, and it does become relevant as the story proceeds, but this story itself doesn't find much resolution. 
question. Like, we never learn who leaked the photo and the show isn't all that hasty about finding a conclusion for Jocelyn here, but rather this photo will be used to try and force Jocelyn to embrace her sexual persona later. As this half of the episode wraps up, we are finally introduced to Abel Tesfaye's character, Tedros Tedros, a club owner that Joss visits with her friends to blow off some steam. Now, Tedros is a supremely interesting character to examine here because for the life of me, I had absolutely no idea whether or not we were supposed to find him skeevy. He blunders around with a rat tail, wearing silk shirts, sunglasses on indoors, leopard print headbands, and a nasty case of the cocaine sweats, and as the show unravels, he definitely performs actions we are supposed to condemn, but as a clear self-insert character for Tess Faye, he's also squarely in the right every single time he makes a judgement, smugly correct on all of his assumptions, and by the end of the finale, his dynamic with Joss has changed so much that he is clearly framed as the victim, which is utterly bizarre. Still, I'm getting ahead of myself. When Joss arrives in the club, Tedros actually stops the music and picks up a microphone just so he can call out to her and ask her to dance with him, and we get this fantastically unsubtle music choice with lyrics like, you're like a dream, and a prayer, and I'm gonna take you to a higher place, which marks the beginning of some extremely on-the-nose choices for the idol that I found absolutely laughable. Joss and Tedros dance and later have a quiet chat on the stairs in the back of the club, during which Leia is played for laughs as she worriedly looks for Joss, who has gone missing. Like her friend, a literal pop star and a tiny like 100 pound woman for whom she is completely responsible, has gone missing from the club and Leia is running around looking for her, and Joss and Tedros are just laughing at her from where they're watching. Leia is deftly distracted by a character named Isaac, a gorgeous tall man with a single bleached eyebrow who invites her to dance with him. Mesmerised by his beauty, she agrees and drops the issue. Joss and Tedros make out for a while, and then Joss goes home to choke herself on the sofa and finger herself stupid. This is a very awkward watch, but we'll count our lucky stars with this one, being that it's one of the only sex scenes in the show that doesn't feature Tedros, so I'll take this any day. As the next day dawns, we get our next theme of the show, revenge is empowerment, or is it? During a conversation with a Vanity Fair reporter, Talia Hirsch, as played by Barbie's Harry Neff, Joss broaches the topic of her leaked cum photo. Talia comments that she can spin this article in Joss's favour, you know, really bite back at the people who leaked the picture. Joss is scornful of this suggestion, asking why. Talia comments, it would be great for all the women and young girls of the world to see you getting back at the guy who did this, and Joss sneeringly snaps, you think revenge is empowerment? Talia responds with, well it's human, and only a few lines later, Joss is gravely saying, I answer to God, dryly sipping her champagne or whatever it is, darkly staring out over the garden. This conversation is unusual in a number of ways, mainly through the way it's either later contradicted or built upon weirdly, but it sets up a few ideas here. Number one, Jocelyn considers revenge to be distasteful. Number two, Jocelyn considers positive journalistic coverage to be revenge. Number three, Jocelyn considers herself to be above that. And, like, on its own, this attitude is fine and respectable. This is a totally cool and even interesting moral code for our protagonist to have. Seeing Jocelyn navigate this world while refusing to lower herself to dirty tricks, or what she considers to be dirty tricks, would make for a very cool set of obstacles for her. Yet this isn't how her arc pans out, because Jocelyn lowers herself to a lot of revenge across the show. Was Jocelyn pretending to the journalist to be honourable, just so that she could get away with revenge later, but none of her revenge is revealed to be revenge, so it makes this conversation stand out in that it directly contradicts her established characterization. Joss confides in the journalist and later Leia in a scene that felt, honestly, really natural, like a natural chat, no sarcasm, that while her comeback single works commercially, she finds it embarrassing to listen to because it's not her and it's not what she wants to make. The conversation moves on to Tedros, who Joss invites to the home. Leia comments that he is so rapey, which is very true, but he arrives nonetheless, stalking through the gate like some spirit Halloween Dracula. Joss asks Leia to keep him waiting while he gets dressed and has one one of her many cigarettes. When you see how much she smokes indoors, you realise that this woman in her house must smell so bad. Regardless, Leia lets Tedros in and he walks in like a fucking Sith Lord. He kisses her at the door in some weird greeting, doing this like 
weird smirk, playing the piano while maintaining unblinking eye contact with Leia, and sniffing the pillows on Joss's sofa. He practices his greeting, hello angel, in the mirror. Well, this chap has the hair of a paedophile. Again, in scenes like this, he is clearly framed as a freakazoid, no doubt about that. We are not supposed to feel comfortable around Tedros, but we still get to enjoy a horrendously sexualized scene that had my skin absolutely crawling. Like, what you'll soon realize makes this show so cringe is the fact that Tedros is simultaneously written to be a slimy creep, but there's also this utmost refusal to characterize him as anything less than a suave sex haver. Only he cannot hold the scene like Lily Rose can. Tess Faye blurts out his lines like he's reading them for the first time, trying to put this whispered edge on everything, but I feel like you need paramount confidence to say half the shit he says, and Tess Faye just doesn't have that. Joss shows Tedros the song that she's been working on while he kneels and takes her shoes off, but she's too distracted by the fact that she thinks her music sucks to get down with this little cretin. Tedros runs an ice cube down her leg, and when she looks up at him with smouldering eyes, we straight up just see Johnny Depp. Are you going to put your penis inside me? I feel so bad for her in this regard because that's a family likeness that's unmistakable. It's not her fault, it's just very obvious. Tedros removes Joss's slutty red robe and puts it over her head like she's the Virgin Mary, commenting that she needs to block out the world. He whispers, do you trust me? And pulls the robe over her head, tying it around her neck with the belt of the robe. And the music swells the whole time as she starts desperately moaning. He's not doing anything to her, but she's moaning like he's got two fingers inside her. It's a very hard watch. Episode 2 starts on an unusual note that I felt might have had something to do with a late-term rewrite or something. Everyone has been summoned to the house to hear the magic Tedros and Joss made the previous night, their remix of her song World Class Sinner, but the atmosphere is very low. Joss is even in a black crop top, which, on a close-up shot of her smoking, sets a tone of grieving, even if you can see the metal straps of her underwear above her low-rise jeans. Not even me being a hater, either. I just love the idea that this is her grieving outfit. Either way, this scene had me very confused because it seemed to imply that her mum had very recently died, rather than a year prior. It only served to make me wonder whether there was an original draft where she had died the night before or something. Nikki is here, quickly becoming my favourite character just for how diabolically she's written, a genuinely awful, selfish sociopath who hand waves the death of Jocelyn's mum under the assertion that everyone dies, get over it, much to the disgust of her fellows. When she hears that Jocelyn wants to show them her new sound, she abruptly asks, what about the sound we made for you? What about it indeed, Nikki? Because this new one is curious. In Tedros's weird sex studio, the pair of them had basically remixed the song to include tons of moaning. Like a percussive moaning. Like the beat is just moaning. It's an excruciating listen when paired with Joss's grinding and gyrating in front of a sofa full of executives who really aren't picking up what she's putting down. Like they seem as uncomfortable as I felt. Her dry humping the air wouldn't have seemed nearly so bad if every everyone else didn't look abundantly unimpressed. As the song draws to a close, Nikki drops probably the best monologue in the show. She's played by Jane Addams, a woman famous enough to have a rich and detailed Wikipedia page, but apparently not famous enough for it to have a picture of her on it. And she's been in loads of stuff, but nothing I've ever seen. Either way, she's excellent. She's head and shoulders one of the best actors in this show, rivaled probably only by Lily Rose herself, and listening to her drop some of the toughest love on Jocelyn was an actual joy. She is great. The crux of the argument here is, your mum died, we told you to cancel your tour, you had a complete psychotic break on a rooftop somewhere a week before you were due to play Madison Square Garden, we had to refund all the tickets, and now you've not made anything for over a year. The song is made, the music video location is booked and paid for, the radio space is paid for, the launch is next week, this is happening as it is. And Jocelyn looks at her like she hates her, but I kind of got it. Like, if you're feeling especially inspired, surely you can channel that into your next song. Two weeks is is supremely late notice to be changing an entire song, and maybe if she wasn't making her first furtive steps back into her career after a breakdown, they could pull some strings and get it done, but it seems like while this song isn't Joss's preference, it's an easy way to ease her back into her music and kickstart her career again. Joss treats this like it's the end of the world and runs back into her Beverly Hills mansion to cry in her massive bed.
head. In the next scene, she is joined by Haim, her father figure, who also voices Apu in The Simpsons, funnily enough, who acknowledges to Jocelyn that he knew her mother abused her. I'll tell you why this is relevant later, but this is a really important scene to me. Later that day, as we edge further into Fifty Shades territory, Jocelyn masturbates by pushing a glass full of ice into her coochie, which surely only numbs the area? Either way, we learn later that it smashes between her thighs, cutting the inside of her legs very badly and apparently, graciously, not hitting one of those pesky major arteries. But this scene more serves to contribute to the executive's later assumption that Joss is self-harming. Joss calls Tedros, clearly desperate to hang out with him, but it's so hard to sell this desire when he is a vacuum of charisma, like a cold, dark void of shaglessness. He does this husky, sexy talk back down the phone to her, and on the other side of the room we see Isaac talking to Joss's assistant, clearly also angling for a way in through her as well. Tedros isn't free to hang out for two full days, which incidentally places his next free day on the same day that Joss will be filming a music video, and she breathlessly agrees to spend time with him then again. The thirst this woman feels for this man is so logically unfounded, but I guess people just write any old shit these days. He also suggests he brings in his team, a move that will add at least a little bit of flavour to the cast. As we dawn on the day of the music video, we see that Joss is actually very invested in her career. She comments that the use of a strip club in her music video is ironic in a way she's worried her fans won't understand, and she cuts takes where she feels as though she's not performing her best. She adapts very well to criticism, and she tries extremely hard. The pressure is clearly crushing her underfoot, as she breathlessly tells her entourage that this isn't going to be right and it's going to be a fucking disaster. Like they just can't take the best segments from each take and splice them together. She needs one absolutely perfect take all the way through. Her thighs have been airbrushed to hide the cuts, but the makeup rubs off fast as the cuts reopen and she begins to bleed, and her feet are in literal tatters. It's when Joss deliriously begins to call up to her mum on stage that Nikki takes her down and tells her to get some rest, promising that she won't scrap the music video and that Joss can come back the following day. Nikki does scrap the music video. The spotlight lingers on Joss as she's carted away. It's symbolism, get it? Wow. Recovering in her home, Joss asks Haim, am I gonna lose everything? And he bitterly responds that he can't keep paying half of the mortgage every month. This line of conversation really bewilders me due to the choice the team made to shoot this series in its entirety in Tess Faye's $70 million mansion in Bel Air. I want a Bel Air mansion, damn it. Either way, hearing a woman ask, have I lost everything? In a fully staffed house with like 20 bedrooms and an indoor and outdoor pool is the epitome of first world problems. I know she isn't necessarily referring to money, she's also referring to her career, but it is extremely difficult to relate to this situation. She could downgrade to a $50 million Bel Air mansion and still have $20 million to live off for the rest of her life. It's a difficult thing to feel a lot of sympathy about. They probably should have used a less luxurious set. In the meantime, a character named Diane, played by Blackpink's Jenny, is scouted by Nikki to take over World Class Sinner due to her dancing and singing ability. It turns out that she is basically owned by Tedros, who tells Diane to tell Nikki to speak to him directly. I can finally get my return on you, he mutters, like a weird thriller villain. Like, I think that one was supposed to be an inside thought, Tedros. Diane is a great inclusion because her actress was basically hired to get the K-pop stands excited for the series. Her involvement was heavily exaggerated in the lead up to the series release, but her screen time per 55 minute episode probably sits at an average of about 3 minutes, and she only gets a few lines in each episode. Her story is so inconsequential that I am not even going to bother to discuss it because it is barely relevant to Joss's story, although it would have made for a great tragic tale on its own, like she's really fantastic as well, so it's a shame she got shafted so hard. But through this moment we are introduced to a plethora of other characters living in Tedros's cult, most notably Chloe, a character whose age isn't revealed to us until much later. She's played by 28-year-old Susanna's son, which partially conceals her canonical age, 18, but like, she is so recently 18 that she stumbles on 17 when answering. I don't know if any of these writers have ever met a teenager, probably on a particular island, I don't know, but Chloe is characterised like a 7-year-old. She skips everywhere and talks like she she has a primary school reading age. She stares at everyone and everything in wonder, with wide open eyes and a slack jaw. She has extremely childlike opinions and observations. When she arrives at Joss's house, she sees the pool and immediately strips naked to go and play in the water. 
she's a really difficult character to engage with on any level because her nudity is so constantly displayed and yeah you know she's 18 whatever that's legal but her childlike mannerisms are so aggressively pervasive that you feel like you are watching a 12 year old it's very uncomfortable she wanders naked through the house, eventually encountering Tedros and Joss having sex, Joss blindfolded, and stares at them in aroused wonder, like she doesn't understand what they're doing, Tedros being well aware of that fact. He's too busy blurting out lines that probably seem really wise and sage in writing, but fall out of him like shoes from a loft. And so we welcome another excruciating sex scene. I think a better actor could handle these scenes far better, but with the bluntness of the dialogue, I have no idea who I'd suggest. He stares at her with very mechanically half-lidded eyes and just announces his lines into the room. Meanwhile Lily Rose is quivering and panting and smiling and breathless and super ready to go, like she really sells this, but he doesn't meet her there. It's like watching a woman wrap her legs around a cereal box. Ultimately, this episode fails on every single level. As the sex ramps up, any scene with physical intimacy of any kind between Tedros and Jocelyn becomes so horrendously hard to watch. It is utterly cringe content, and anything that comes out of Tedros's mouth makes me want to stand up and pace the room just to work the awkwardness out of me. There is a real opportunity here to tell a story clearly based on the experience of young female stars growing up under the intense pressure of a life they might not necessarily be ready for, fielding corrupting influences and fighting for her own agency in a corporate world that just wants her to churn out hits, but it simply doesn't happen here. We embark on the odyssey of misery that is episode 3, beginning in the car as Leia drives the horny couple into LA to go shopping together. They're not wearing seatbelts, stupid, instead opting to crawl all over one another. He even licks her out on the back seat, very unsafe shouldn't do that. This episode is all about quote unquote revealing that Tedros's possessive temper is just as potent as his musical genius and Joss drinks the Kool-Aid wholeheartedly. Again, Tedros's behaviour is never shown to be positive. Joss is surrounded by people such as Leia, Haim and her mother figure Destiny who all see Tedros as a complete maniac, whose grip on Jocelyn is as dangerous as it is strong, and if that energy was maintained this would be great. But as we'll see, Tedros is shown repeatedly to be extremely clever, correct, and by the end he is a major victim, like the biggest victim in the show. And while there is effort made to demonstrate alternative perspectives to Tedros's attitude throughout each episode, it doesn't pan out. While shopping with Jocelyn, Tedros becomes enraged when one of the store clerks visually appraises her outfit. Like he brings her a dress, she tries it on in front of him, and he looks her up and down. Erratically furious, Tedros demands to see this guy's dick. He becomes coldly commanding when Leia says she needs to run any household decisions by Joss, as that's the person she works for. He smacks Joss's personal chef and forces her to fire him. But she's fully in there, teasing him in the changing room until he slaps her across the face a bunch and then shags her doggy style. This this is probably the funniest sex scene being that Tesfaye frantically hangs out the back of Joss throughout this. He humps her like a chihuahua, generating pure friction as he like vibrates on her ass. Lily Rose Depp gives a performance of a lifetime in moments like this. I have no idea how she got through a scene without laughing. Their insipid dynamic rolls over into a scene in Joss's garden where she and Tedros are speaking to Haim and Destiny who are keen to learn more about him. Tedros fastidiously hides his past, his name, his school, his birthplace, and Joss Joss sits there justifying him out loud, defending him constantly. I really like the way that Joss is written in these scenes actually. There's quite a few scenes where she is a tantamount toxic girlfriend, enabling and even excusing Tedros's particularly foul behaviour. And in this scene specifically she is doing this thing where she feels like she needs to de-escalate tension by speaking for him. And clearly she's so wrapped up in his lies that she believes him wholeheartedly, like she laughs off legitimate questions. I can't speak for any other demographic but I'd wager that all women have been that at one point in their life or have seen that at one point in their life. Maybe both. So these scenes were very relatable in a jaded way. It's just a shame that it doesn't pan out substantially. This isn't something she grows from nor something that finds relevance later, so she remains the same. 
Tedros's weird attitude persists well into the next scene, where he asks Xander what he'd do if he had full creative control, specifically asking if you had carte blanche in a line that made me giggle out loud both times I heard it, and Xander says he'd take the cum photo and make it Joss's album cover. Tedros is impressed, and later that night, when the members of the house are sitting around after dinner, he asks Xander to voice this idea. The following scene is one I found to be really frustrating, because this is the scene where Tedros begins to do his wise sage thing, coupling what he clearly assumes to be profound advice with, like, tough love that just verges on insane disrespect. It's the kind of tough love you get from people who completely lack empathy. Like when you tell somebody that you had an argument with your dad and they go, just go no contact. Like that's not one of the most extreme actions a functional adult could take and certainly wouldn't be taken without good cause. His pretentious ignorance really comes through in the writing and unlike Tedros's intentionally sleazy characterization where we're not really supposed to feel comfortable, we are consistently shown how wise and correct he is. So this really is like an eye roller of a scene. When Xander pitches the idea of the Come Face album cover, Jocelyn is understandably in two minds. She jokes that the tagline could be new music coming soon and suggests that she may as well own this. People supporting her and criticizing her are both simultaneously making bank off the back of her and driving people to go and find the photo. If she makes it her album cover, she takes back some of that control. But at the same time, she isn't comfortable. Fear. She voices that it's utterly humiliating. She doesn't want to kickstart a career with a cum face album cover, like it's not the tone she wants to set for her music. She states that she wants people to take her seriously, and she wants to make music that connects. And while there is definitely a nuanced debate to be had there regarding whether that might actually connect pretty well, like surprisingly well, Tedros's written approach is just really distasteful. He asks a ton of questions, grilling her about what specifically is making her uncomfortable. In this scene, he is a wise sage, asking the difficult questions that Joss somehow doesn't have an answer for, asking the right questions, arguing the right facts, in his mind anyway. His arguments come off really weak, which combined with his lack of gravitas in the scene makes it really difficult to understand why the entire table isn't laughing at him especially since Lily Rose is dominating this scene with her acting, portraying the perfect, bitter, helpless rage one might feel in a situation like this. She doesn't feel like she's being listened to or respected, but there's a part of her that feels like he might be right, because of course there is, whereas he just has a straight face. There's no emotion conveyed, it's a stunning contrast of acting ability, which is made ten times worse by this clearly being something written to be an assumed clever moment. Like this is Tedros really spreading his wings and demonstrating his music marketing genius and his command over the people at the table. This scene is unbelievably pretentious. Still, this conversation gives way to a topic I found infinitely interesting, both in how it's literally discussed by the characters, but also in how it pays off in the story. So when talking about writing songs based off Jocelyn's own experiences and using those experiences to touch her audience, to relate to them, Xander comments that her audience won't understand Jocelyn because she has uniquely suffered, and Joss lowers her eyes and solemn agreement, she really believes that she has suffered in a way that nobody else has. Jocelyn admits that her mother used to hit her with a hairbrush, until the chemo made her too weak to lift an arm anymore. She used to hit her hard enough to break skin. Said hairbrush has been foreshadowed so many times throughout this show so far. We saw frequent flashes to it, or shots lingering on it. We saw Joss brushing Chloe's hair with it as she opened up about her mother's death, creating a physical metaphor of Joss sharing something personal with Chloe. We also see Joss fuming furiously brushing her own hair in a weird manic rage. There are a few points here and I'm going to do the most important one first. I wanted to leave this for a later reveal, but I'm going to look like a very unsympathetic dick if I don't mention this now. Joss's mother did not beat her with a hairbrush. This won't be confirmed until the final 15 minutes of the finale, but I really need to make it clear now. This is Jocelyn lying to the group, the entire group, for reasons I couldn't quite understand, like sympathy maybe? But Tedros will later spank her with this hairbrush to give her some inspiration for her music. So there clearly was an end goal here that I couldn't quite grasp. Secondly, Xander is Joss's close childhood friend, so 
he would know if she was being beaten with a brush. And when we circle back to the previous scene with Haim, we remember that he also acknowledged Joss's abuse. So we have testimony from separate characters at separate times in the show that Joss's childhood at the hands of her mother was an extremely unpleasant one. Yet when we get to the finale, it's revealed that this was all a fabrication. Either a few plot holes weren't properly ironed out during the writing stage, or we are genuinely supposed to believe that Joss has been playing the long game since she was like five years old. Thirdly, this is the smallest and weakest point I have to make here, and it really is just more of an opinion on the scene, like a personal opinion, but I love that this woman seems to think that having an abusive mother makes her so unique in her suffering that not one single listener would be able to understand her on the level she wants to be understood on. Like, being open about this might not make her more relatable. She's got, like, major main character syndrome. This is first world problems incarnate. Tedros, in his I am a self-insert wisdom, combines dreadful dialogue and dreadful delivery when he asks, why didn't you fight back? And bizarrely isn't somehow told to go fuck himself by everybody at the table. It's obscene. He asks this question in such a definitively confident way, like he's heard her explain her childhood over the course of 20 seconds and now feels like he can comment on it with precise judgement. Sure, a lot of people do this, but they're often told to shut up. Tedros is in way too much of this show. As the music swells, the weekend singing, I I've been manipulated a hundred times in a shallow attempt to foreshadow that Joss is lying about her childhood abuse, he tells Joss to bring him the hairbrush in front of everyone in the house, like 14 other significantly more interesting characters, Tedros beats Joss with the hairbrush until she is bleeding and crying. This scene is extremely melodramatic, and I just look away for most of it because it's kind of cringe. And then the episode ends. The fourth episode of The Idol opens on a new vibe for Joss's Bel Air mansion. She now has armed security patrolling the grounds and maids cleaning up drugs and pulling dildos off bathroom walls. Mike Dean is lounging around, ripping the fattest bong I've ever seen, and Tedros is sitting at the head of Jocelyn's dining table like some kind of warlord. Leia stands bitterly in front of him with her iPad as she reads out Joss's calendar to him and he systematically demands that she cancel every appointment. There's an atmosphere of instability, punctuated by a conversation we watch unfold between Haim and Destiny, who have learned more about Tedros's past. Apparently he kidnapped and tortured his ex-girlfriend, a feat that landed him in prison for a long time, and a feat that Haim and Destiny discuss killing him over, to have him removed before Jocelyn can get hurt in the crossfire. She's pretty happy in the situation for now, writing a song about how she doesn't like having control over her life, all the while Tedros is sniffing her hair, grinding on her, running his hands all over her, an act of PDA that would have me in the fetal position. Seriously man, we get it, you wrote a show so that you could touch women. This is exactly what a 14 year old boy would consider to be cool. Destiny visits the house to check on Joss, meeting the newly revealed 18 year old Chloe, who rapturously explains that Tedros saved her life forever, years ago when he found her addicted to heroin on the streets of LA, and how she now sleeps in the club with him. Destiny watches this unfold with disgust, but as usual, these kinds of revelations don't really unfold in a way that drops the backlash on Tedros, who gets called a pimp and then basically gets left to it. It's in this episode that the campaign against Leia really begins to ramp up too, presumably an effort on part of the cult members to alienate Joss's only friend. She's been peripherally whinging over the course of the season so far, but at this point her alienation really begins. I would assume Joss's assistant would have more jurisdiction than this, but she is just here to get emotionally abused by everybody else. Joss is the fucking worst about it as well. At one point, Tedros sprays Leia with a water gun to humiliate her in front of everyone at the house, and Joss is just like, oh my god, Tedros, stop it, that's so mean, as she like cuddles him and puts her hands all over him, like you know she would be the worst friend ever. Leia deserves so much better. Isaac, not so much her partner as he is just her handler, since he gets off with everyone he fancies, more there to keep her busy and not asking questions, even suggests that if you're not a supporter, then you're an obstacle. A cruel and spiteful thing to accuse Leia of. Of course, this all feeds into the cult vibe of the series, we're not supposed to root for what he's saying here, but as with all these Tedros moments, it's supposed to seem harsh but fair. On that note, Joss's bizarre emotional immaturity is laid very bare across the course of this episode. Need I remind you that Destiny is her mother figure? Well, that doesn't quite stop Joss from allowing Tedros to finger her, blindfolded, 
with an audience, just so she can produce some sexy moans for the track. I refuse to believe that a woman who can cry on command during a sterile photo shoot can't muster a sexy moan during a music track. Plus, this is another absolutely gag-punching scene, so thanks for that, guys. Cheers. Tedros stands behind her, arms wrapped around her waist and rubbing her over her pants, and he frequently stops to grin at the audience, directly looking at the camera in the process in this really smug way. Like, look at him, he's got the music star all cummy in his hands. What a cool guy. Destiny walks out like, he's bad news, but again, no one does anything. We are consistently told that Tedros is not only a creep, but also an active danger to the women he dates, but nothing happens to him at any point. By the time the situation ramps up enough for Destiny and Haim to want to do anything about it, Tedros is already made into a victim and vindicated. The writing is happy to show Tedros is a bad guy, there's no doubting that, but it is so reluctant to make him atone in a way that doesn't also make him a victim, which nullifies it. The worst he gets is a tearful face while listening to Joss shag her ex in the next room, but he's being actively cheated on at this moment, which, while delicious, means he's never so much held accountable as he is just abused back, and he ends up being a bigger victim by the finale, which is a feat you can imagine was basically impossible to pull off, which is exactly why they didn't manage to. Destiny even comments, he gets the best out of her, but he does crazy things to get the best out of her, framing Tedros's actions as extreme, but ultimately productive and perhaps healthy. I feel like this show really failed to take the opportunity to point fingers at some of the ways stars are exploited, how they are publicly owned humans, the pressure, the lack of privacy, the corruption, the susceptibility to bad outside influences, the need to rebel, but instead we just have to watch tons of weird sex scenes. There's loads of wasted potential here, potential wasted for the specific sake of making Tedros look like some kind of charismatic cult leader, and most of this episode is just dedicated to him behaving like an evil genius, while everyone around him talks about how brilliant but also broken he is. In one scene, Tedros runs into some pig pen he's keeping all of his people in, making them sleep on the floor despite this clearly being an enormous house, and wakes them up like a drill sergeant. He grills them on their understanding of the word family, and puts Xander in a shock collar we've previously seen used consensually on other members of this cult. It's not being used consensually on Xander, who is practically begging for his life after the first zap, in fact it's used to torture him for information. Under extreme duress, Xander admits that he doesn't sing anymore because Joss won't let him. She accuses him of lying and he gets zapped. Tedros then asks Xander about Joss's mum's abuse why didn't he say anything? Setting aside the fact that Xander and Joss are the same age, being childhood friends, and that we can't really expect a child to know what to do, this really is an opportunity for Xander to say Joss was lying about that, but he doesn't. You could argue that Joss might just accuse him of lying and have Tedros shock him again, but Xander runs his mouth a lot here and it doesn't come out. I feel like even someone blindly loyal to Joss would fold under literal torture, even a bit. Xander ends up with some pretty pissed pants, but this seems to mark his absorption into the cult. After this moment, he is entirely loyal to Tedros and the rest of his cult members, although beyond the shock colour, we don't really see why, nor what compels him. Tedros's rat tail is unfurling in these scenes too. It's a metaphor, see? Probably a metaphor for the fuckload of cocaine he's taking, which begins to make him erratic and fighty, seen bitterly arguing with Joss when she's trying to write her lyrics. If we separate Jocelyn's arc out into chunks, we have three stages. The first stage is her return to superstardom, the pressure she's under, the return to singing. The second stage is her relationship with Tedros, the like weird cringe rutting, the abysmally impossible sell. And the third stage, the third stage is Jocelyn's reveal. Now, the show cannot quite be sure whether or not Jocelyn has always been a manipulator, or whether her manipulation begins at the end of this episode when she learns, spoilers, that Tedros isn't who she thought he was. Rather, he's a con man who had Joss's friends lure her to the club so that he could meet her, fed information that would make her feel like he really knew her, and then he could bone her. She is so bitterly upset by this that she invites her ex to the house party, a young gentleman nicknamed Heartthrob Rob, and has some very obvious sex with him, a move that devastates Tedros, and her emotional detachment begins. Was she always a manipulator, or did she only decide to destroy Tedros's life when she found out how possessively he'd interfered with hers? The series suggests both, and also kind of neither. Also, Tedros successfully frames Rob for sexual assault, costing him his career.
In episode 5, we encounter a very sweaty Tedros, a man who clearly needs a little rest from the massive amounts of drugs he's taking, still sitting around after getting utterly cucked by Jocelyn the night before. He's moping, and she tells him several times straight up to get out of her house and to leave her alone, but he doesn't. He just sits around sweatily and miserably as Joss says things like, you've served your purpose, I'm done with you, foreshadowing some of her bizarre villain dialogue that we'll see later when the reality is revealed, that Joss Jocelyn was the evil villain all along, and he was merely some sad little guy who manifested one chance to be with her, and is now just another ruined man left in her wake. Jocelyn poaches all of his singers too, in a showcase that dominates the majority of the episode. Isaac, Chloe, some weird goth girl, and Xander all sing in front of the record label executives, earning themselves spots on Joss's tour. She performs a very uncomfortable, hypersexualized lip sync performance in front of a man who then refers to himself as a parental figure to her her and tells her everything you went through led to this, echoing some of Tedros's earlier teachings that experiences make us make better art, vindicating him despite his alienation from the cast. Tedros ends up getting escorted out by Haim as Joss goes and prays on her knees outside in the garden in a scene that just felt cringe and off and entirely unearned. Like, what grace are we going for here? Tedros is offered $500,000 to never see Joss again, but he rips up the check. Romantically, he whispers, she is worth so much more than that, and Haim announces that it will be Plan B now instead, and he loves Plan B. While the tone he takes does imply that he's going to kill Tedros, instead he goes back to the Vanity Fair journalist and feeds her with enough information to destroy Tedros's career. Still weirdly, this isn't quite how things pan out for him. Six weeks later, we dawn on Joss's arrival at her concert. Incidentally, and cool fact, but they ran out of time and money when filming The Idol, and so used two of the weekend's actual tour arena venues while filming these final scenes so that they could have a concert full of un paid extras. If you look during the scenes, you can see that everyone is really confused, despite having had cheers added over the audio in post. In her dressing room, she reveals to Tedros that she lied about the hairbrush beatings. Her hairbrush is brand new, a fact she delivers with an uncaring smirk at a man who delivers his first piece of genuine acting. Tesfaye can do the cold horror of realisation pretty well. This was a nice final scene for him to deliver. Heading up on stage, Joss introduces Tedros to the crowd as the man who pulled me through the darkest hours and into the light, the love of my life. Like stars just get their partners up on stage at the beginning of all their concerts, she messily kisses him and tells him, you're mine forever. Then, in case you miss the fact that she's actually the one in control, she goes, now go and stand over there. And that's it, that's our ending. Like an ice queen, Joss stands at the head of the crowd, staring over them with regal entitlement, emotional detachment. She is our villain, and accordingly she has been all along, in some sense, because the show demonstrates to us two Josses manipulator Joss and revenge Joss. If we follow the thread of manipulator Joss, we see a girl who has been lying to everybody around her since she was a child, producing a very long-winded story about her mother's constant abuse, truly playing the long game without a single mistake or a moment of remorse. This could be backed up by the initial photography scene because we can see that she's a very capable actress, it's certainly backed up by the hairbrush reveal, and it's potentially backed up by some of the more bitter comments Xander makes across the course of the story. However, revenge Joss implies a thread of growth that began the moment she learned that Tedros had betrayed her. Her previous comments to the Vanity Fair woman, for example, imply that Joss feels a general distaste towards revenge, an opinion she maybe changes when learning about Tedros's betrayal. Maybe this is her change. She also seems extremely willing to be involved with him. She believes him without question, she hangs off him, she's desperately horny for him whatever, as long as you're happy. I guess you can choose to believe whichever interpretation of Joss you want to believe, especially since both sides have some pretty reasonable evidence to back them up. But since there's so little grounds for either, and it contradicts her actual behaviour that we see so much, I found I couldn't invest myself in either interpretation. Joss's writing is too flimsy to pull off a reveal like this. It's not You can't sell that. She goes from being an extremely dedicated, earnest starlet who honestly loves her craft, to being a stereotypical master manipulator femme fatale over the course of like 15 business days. I feel like this twist was more intended to absolve Tedros Tedros for his behaviour. He might be a sleazy con man, sure, but he has sex real good with sexy women and he's always correct. And now we find out that he is actually the victim of abuse and control, dragged around 
around by Jocelyn the entire time. This overshadows and absolves him of all of his sins, and as Joss takes control of his cult and him by extension, it's like she's inheriting his sins too. She is the bigger bad, and consequently Tedros escapes the series not only unscathed, but also sympathetic. Ultimately, The Idol was a tragic case of self-parody. Initially intended to be an examination of treading water in an industry under crippling pressure from corporate capitalism and staying true to yourself in the process, The Idol ended up being a vanity project full of self-inserts who just so happened to help women find their voice by fingering them, all while continuing to simp for that same corporate capitalism. While bodily autonomy is championed, the systems that maintain the safety of starlets is mocked and judged. Sexuality is used as a vessel simply to produce the kind of content 14 year old boys would gravitate towards, and the ultimate conclusion of the series saw our vanity self insert sheepishly crushed under the foot of a woman who secretly turned out to be a bigger abuser than he ever was, whilst also admitting that she still somehow remained entirely in love with him. He's even accepted by her team and by her friends at the end, except for Leia, obviously who bails and walks away unscathed, getting to go on and have sex with someone just as toxic as him forevermore. The best actors in this show are shoved to the side for the sake of injecting the series with these heartburningly cringe sex scenes, and the overall message fluctuates horribly between revenge is empowerment, hurt people hurt people, and rich women are assholes. Joss's character never seems to find clarity, Tedros has plot armour because he shags good allegedly, and the corporate capitalists are all very happy and very, very rich as the show draws to a close. I don't think there's a person on the planet I would recommend The Idol to. I think it's too boring to be a hate watch either. Despite being only five episodes long, it somehow like disgusts and drags, and I had to watch it twice to check the facts on my script. It has aged me horrendously inside and out. Still, I'm glad I looked at it. Ripping into this series has brought me new life. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to drop a like and subscribe here on the channel. We cover all sorts of things, movies, TV, video games, and if you like that sort of thing, you will love the rest of my content. Secondly, thank you very much to my patrons, including Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brendan Sidereal, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocher, Christopher Chavez, Fosh, Heidi, Carissa Fulcher, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. Thank you for your support, thank you very much, and thank you to Cool Shirts for sponsoring this video. See you in the next one.